Hey Vikes, uh, welcome to Friday. I got a um, short presentation here for you looking at the stuff that you've uh, looked at this week. And uh, then I have a task for you to work on today and over the weekend, or if you don't want to do it over the weekend, early next week. Um, so we're going to be dealing with uh, Abigail Adams and the David Foster Wallace uh, um, pieces that you looked at earlier this week. Um, first, I want to remind you, if you haven't, to go ahead and go to AP Classroom. Uh, I've set up a, um, a multiple choice test for you. It's kind of a skills test here. I think it's got like 18 questions on it. If you can go ahead and take that, if you haven't already, that will give me an idea of how you're doing on some of these skills that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. And then next week, I'll have another one that will cover um, some of the skills that we've looked at this week um, through the, the learning that we're doing here. Um, another thing that I probably should have set up before um, I uh, did this video is uh, AP, if you haven't noticed yet, is doing some um, live streaming of uh, different skills that teachers from across the country are teaching. Um, for example, you can see here uh, English language is live right now. They're explaining the significance and or relevance of, uh, I'll go ahead and pause it here so we don't have to listen to her at the moment, um, explaining the significance or relevance of the writer's use of sophisticated word. So that might be something that, uh, um, that will be something that I would like you to uh, take a look at. And uh, um, as we get closer to the test, especially, I'll be linking to a lot of this. The skills that they're um, showing through these YouTube videos right now are skills that probably aren't going to be um, covered on the test. But as you can see here, you know, I noticed the word sophisticated and based on the rubric that they were going to use, and I don't know if they're still going to use that writing rubric, um, sophistication is worth one of those points. So this would be something that I think would be beneficial for a lot of you, especially those of you who feel pretty confident in your writing skills um, as you should uh, um, at this moment. Um, but Definitely, I'm going to be pushing these as we get closer, especially as we start to do some more intense prep. And once we know exactly what's going to be on the test, which uh, hopefully a week from today, we'll get a much better idea of what that test is going to look like. All right. So today, looking at introductions and conclusions. Um, here. I've got a couple of necessary skills here. These are things that uh, you need to be able to um, complete this task uh, successfully. So first off, reading. We've been doing this a lot this year. We've talked about the rhetorical situation, um, the exigence, uh, the audience, the writer, the purpose, the context, and the message. Uh, that's why I would have you do those rhetorical triangles. You're looking at this information. You're just trying to get a good rhetorical read of the piece that you're looking at. And then you can dive in more deeply into um, the rhetorical analysis. Um, writing. The particular skill we're working on today that I've concentrated on with the Abigail Adams letter and the David Foster Wallace essay are you need to write introductions and conclusions appropriate to the purpose and context of the rhetorical situation. So when you're writing your introduction and your conclusion for any essay, you need to think about what is your rhetorical situation? Why are you writing this? What prompted you to write this? If we go back here to the exigence, um, who is your audience? You have to make sure that whatever you're writing is appropriate for this audience. Who are you as a writer? You have a particular voice and a particular style and the information that you convey should be communicated to your audience through your introduction and conclusion. What is your purpose? In the two pieces, we're going to look at um, the purpose of each of those pieces and how they're able to, if not communicate it directly through the introduction or the conclusion, to allude to it in some way. What is the context? Uh, with Abigail Adams, obviously her son was thousands of miles away on a voyage to France. Um, with David Foster Wallace, he's giving a speech, but he's also giving it to that particular audience, those Kenyan college graduates. And then ultimately, what is your message? What is it that you're trying to say? 
And this is unique from the purpose. The purpose is what you're trying to accomplish, and what you're trying to accomplish might be, I have this particular message that I want to share. All right. So first we're going to start with the Abigail Adams letter to her son. So we think about the rhetorical situation in this, uh, um, in this case here. So we think about the exigence. Um, you know, what prompted her to write this letter? Well, her son is thousands of miles away, and she wants to keep up communication uh, with her son. Her audience, her son, but not just anybody. It's her oldest son, and he is a reluctant participant in this voyage. He didn't want to go. Who is the writer? Abigail Adams. She's stuck at home with the other kids, um, but she's also an extremely intelligent woman, one of uh, America's first feminists, um, a strong role model uh, for you know, women who have followed her um, throughout the years. What is her purpose in the letter? Well, let's take a look here. So she starts off with basically greeting him, um, telling him that she loves him. She acknowledges that he didn't want to go. Um, and she kind of chastises him here. If I had thought from your reluctance arose from proper deliberation or that you were capable of judging what was most for your own benefit, Really? Yeah. She's mom and she knows best. And she's basically telling him here, you weren't capable of making this decision, so we made it for you. Okay. He's probably old enough to understand that his mother is pretty intelligent and knows what she's talking about. So we think about her purpose in writing this letter and throughout the entire letter, She's really telling him that he needs to take advantage of these opportunities that he's being given through this journey. Uh, he broadens his education. She eventually introduces that metaphor of the stream that picks up nutrients as it goes and becomes richer as it flows along. She compares him to the stream. She talks about this being a great time for geniuses, that um, the character of men is not built through inaction, but through adversity. And he's going through his own adversity. Traveling across the sea was not an easy task. So he needs to be willing to stand up and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, so that's her, the context there, or the purpose there, um, and her message, they, they often tie together. And the context being that he's, on his way to France, or likely by the time he receives the letter, he's in France with his father, um, and she's thousands of miles away. So we look at the introduction here and uh, um, what she is uh, presenting to her son, and we think about what a proper introduction will do. An introduction may present the argument's thesis. Well, she doesn't really get to the thesis in the introduction, but she is focusing the audience. There are different ways that you can do that, and you can see that I've highlighted those ways here. She can use quotations. She can use intriguing statements. She can use anecdotes. She can include questions, statistics, data, contextualized information, meaning how does she present this information in a particular context, look at it through a particular set of eyes, or she could present a scenario. So how does Abigail Adams engage her son or introduce her thesis in this introduction? Well, she loves her son. She states that clearly in the first uh, um, sentence there. She acknowledges that he didn't want to go. And the language that she uses here, repent, reluctance, averse, indicates his attitude toward this particular journey. She acknowledges that. She also tells us clearly she doesn't have confidence in his ability to make a decision. Um, if she thought that he was capable of judging what was um, most for his own benefit, then he, she wouldn't have urged him to accompany um, his father and brother on this particular journey. So she gets to the heart of her thesis here by telling us or telling her son, she's not telling us, but she's telling her son that she knows best. 
And the advice that she's about to give him within this essay is the advice that she that he should follow. So then we, we're going to jump to the conclusion. We're going to look at how she um, finalizes all this. And I already talked about how she goes through the conclusion, or she goes through the essay, um, introduces the metaphor, talks about this being a great time for men of genius, that adversity builds character, essentially. Um, and now she needs to bring this argument to a unified end. She has to make sure that she maintains his focus on her message. There are different ways that she can do that, that any writer can do that. And I've highlighted those here in a rainbow of colors. She could explain the significance of the argument within a broader context. She can make some sort of connection. She can call the audience to act. That's the call to action. She can suggest a change in behavior or attitude. She could propose a solution. She could leave the audience with a compelling image or explain certain implications of her argument. She could summarize the argument. I know that's a pretty popular one that we've taught you in the past. And she can connect it to the introduction. That's always a strong element that she can use. So what does Abigail Adams do here? Well, if we take a look at the conclusion here, and this is a very 18th century um, way of doing it. The strict and inviolable regard you have ever give, paid to truth gives me pleasing hopes that you will not swerve from her dictates. But add justice, fortitude, and every manly virtue which can adorn a good citizen. Do honor to your country and render your parents supremely happy, particularly your ever affectionate mother. So the appeal to emotion here obviously is strong. She loves her son and she's kind of playing up to this manly attitude that you know he might want to present. But what's she doing here? So when I look at this, I kind of see, okay, she is calling him to act in some way. She um, knows, she acknowledges that he has a strict and inviolable regard for the truth. He believes in the truth. It's inviolable. Um, it cannot be broken. So truth is a strong character trait that he possesses. And she wants him to add justice, fortitude, and every manly virtue to that list of character traits that he possesses. That's the call to action. Obviously, it's a change in behavior. Um, she acknowledged it, his behavior was he didn't want to go on this trip in the first place. She wants him to change his mind there. Um, in a sense, she's proposing a solution here. Um, in order for you to change your mind, in order for you to have a better attitude about it, you need to add justice, fortitude, and every manly virtue. Um, she's kind of summarizing her argument here. She talked in her essay about you know, issues related to justice and fortitude. Um, so she picks a few of these strategies here and uses those strategies in her conclusion. Um, but there's also really this compelling image, this compelling image of the ever affectionate mother. She loves her son. He's thousands of miles away. He's still young. He didn't want to go. And here's his mother sending him this loving letter from across the ocean. And he most likely misses her. And it's good that even though the words that she shared with him before he left were probably harsh, you know, you better go on this trip, son. Um, she still loves him, and it's important for him to recognize that and receive that message. All right, so let's look at This is Water by David Foster, David Foster Wallace here. Um, so he, we look at the different things that are listed that what readers can or writers can do to focus the reader on um, an introduction. And he gives us this little story here. It's a, a kind of anecdote. Um, and he directly tells us what his message is. Um, the point of the fish story is merely that the obvious important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Okay, so we know what his message is. 
Um, we know that he, we think about the rhetorical situation. So he was um, delivering a speech to Kenyan college graduates. His uh, audience, obviously, these are people around, you know, in their early 20s. Um, they're about to go out into the world. He's supposed to give some advice. He's a recognized author um, at this point in his life, shortly before the end of his life. Um, so we have some some kind of context there and understanding of, uh, you know, the background of the speech here. Um, and so he's he's kind of giving us this 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 anecdote to introduce his particular message. And he spends a lot of time on this particular message. And then he gets to his conclusion. So we think about what is he doing um, to his conclusion here? Um, and when I look at it, I see, well, he's kind of explaining the significance of the argument within a broader context. Um, you know, he doesn't want people to think that, oh, this is just some uh, platitude that I'm delivering here, that I'm just some speaker and, and I'm getting paid a lot of money to, to share my message with you, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Um, he kind of acknowledges that. And then he does the big thing that really ties it all together. He goes back to that anecdote, that parable that he shared at the beginning about the fish, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over this is water, this is water. He connects it to the introduction and he does in a very um, strong way there. He doesn't really need to he, summarize his argument or explain implications. Um, there's not really one compelling image, is not really a, really a solution that he's proposing when he gets to the end of his speech. He's not really suggesting a change in behavior or attitude. Um, he kind of is calling them to act. He really wants them to keep reminding themselves over and over, this is water, this is water. So we look at introductions and conclusions. We look at uh, um, advice that is being given to people. And so I have a task here for you. And I'll have details for this on Google Classroom as well. The exigence here is you're giving a speech to this year's seniors. Well, the context, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has wrecked havoc on their final semester. They've lost out on sports seasons, um, a lot of preparation for AP exams. A lot of them are concerned about their grades. Um, we're getting to the point now where we're asking questions like, are we going to have prom? Or are we going to have graduation? So that's kind of the context that we've got. Obviously, the audience is the class of 2020, but many of these people are your friends. So you have to think about those people um, when you're doing the writing here in a moment. Um, you are the writer. So what unique qualities or qualifications do you have to present this information? The purpose of the speech is to motivate them to finish their senior year strong. And then I leave the message up to you. Whatever that message might be, that's what you're going to share. But you're not going to write the entire speech. I'm not going to make you um, write this speech. But there are some things that I do want you to write. First, I want you to develop a thesis. Write out a thesis statement that identifies your message to this particular audience. So you have to think about who your audience is. I don't want you to be vague on this. This isn't just any high school senior. These are Curtis High School seniors. So you might think of a particular context and the things that they are missing out on. You would know that better than I would. I want you to write an introduction. How are you going to introduce this speech? Are you necessarily going to include your thesis in that speech? Is this going to be a formal speech? Is it going to be informal? Again, think about the rhetorical situation here. And then I want you to write a conclusion. How are you going to sum this up? How are you going to take this message that you've got, introduce at the beginning, and wrap it up at the end? Now, this might be a particularly challenging thing for a lot of people. You want to start at the beginning. You just want to dive through it until you get to the end. But I want you to focus in particular on the introduction and the conclusion. Write those. If you want to write the entire speech, you are certainly welcome to do so. 
but I'm just looking for the introduction and the conclusion. And what I'm looking for as I give you feedback on this are how are you using the strategies that were introduced in this presentation. So we go back to our list here. These are different choices that you have for concluding your argument. I go back to our introduction here. These are different options that you have for introducing your message in this particular essay. So have fun with this. Think about this. Don't feel like you have to sit down today and finish this assignment. This might be something that you want to think about over the weekend and then come back at on Monday. Um, not exactly sure, looking at my, my chart here, I kind of have a, a, a poster that the AP gave me up on my wall. I had to take down a, another poster and tape this up on the wall at my home office here. Um, I think next week what we're going to look at is we're going to look at argument. So we'll go back to uh, issues of argument, um, going back to lines of reasoning. Let's see. Yeah. And then we'll probably look at uh, some issues of uh, word choice and syntax and how they tie into tone. Maybe I'll um, focus on those particular issues uh, for a few of the lessons next week. Again, um, take your time with this. Um, enjoy yourselves. Have a great day. And I've been talking for 21 minutes, so I need to shut up now. Have fun.